important day today. A very, very important day today. Oops, let me do this first before I forget. So if you're joining me for the first time, welcome. Lovely to see you. Thank you for joining me. Gosh, all my groups are all lined up today. Um, there we go. That's wonderful. Do that one. I think that's everybody. Yes, it is. Lovely. Phantasmagorical on the cliff. Look, Jane Cross is in already. So is Deborah Kane. Wow. Hello, folks. I'll be right with you. So I don't need to invite Jane Cross because she's already there. Better remember to invite Christian. No, he's there. And um, where is he? Where's Ray? Oh, Ray's not there. Can't even annoy Ray. I was going to invite Ray cause, just to annoy him. Um, there's Jenny. Right. Wonderful. Alison's watching as well. Rebecca's watching too. That's fantastic. Right. I'm hoping at some point I'll get a clue um, that my aunt is watching because it's her a very big birthday for her today. And she's one of my favorite human beings on the whole planet and probably always has been. Uh, that's my Aunt Frances. You like the shirt again? Thank you so much indeed. That's grand. I think I've got five really nice jazzy ones and I might, um, I'll get another couple and then I'll just interchange them from time to time. Uh, anyway, you're here for storytelling, aren't you? <clears throat> but it, today is the 90th birthday of one of my favorite people on the whole planet. And that's my Aunt Frances. Oh, there's Christian. I couldn't find you to tag you, Christian. So thank you so much indeed. Uh, donc, uh, je veux dire, on, on se connaît assez bien pour tutoyer. Ça, ça te va ou pas? Dis-le-moi. Dis si on, on, on se va, oui, on, donc, on, on est d'accord. Bien, bien. Si pas, non, il n'y a pas de souci. Um, I just asked Christian if it's okay if we use the familiar between us um, because we've now been chatting to one another quite a bit online. And Christian's watching all the way from Canada. And there's, look, Jane Cross watching from French France. So, okay, lovely. All right, okay, then I'll, I'll private message you later, Jane, to see how you're doing. Sorry you're not having a good day. Anyway, um, it's really interesting in life, you know, there are certain people who have, play a major influence or a major role in our lives. And for me, apart from the da, and maybe my two best male friends in the whole world, um, although I've do, I have a new friend called David Green, he hardly ever watches anymore, but uh, on a serious note, um, the major influences of my life have been women, and I've been very blessed in that respect. Uh, my mother was a wonderful woman. Um, uh, that's great. On se connaît si bien, on peut se tutoyer. Thank you so much indeed. Um, my mother was a wonderful influence, but my father's Aunt Mary, my great Aunt Mary, I adored her. Everybody loved great Auntie Mary. She was a scream. Um, a, ga a game old bird. She was just fantastic. Uh, a spinster all her life, but a wonderful, wonderful woman. And then my mother's sister called Eileen, who's long, long since passed. She was one of the first people to go through a hip replacement uh, hip replacement surgery and it probably would have been the 60s or 70s when it was first being done and I mean she was one of the first to go through it and it was an entire day operation back then because they were still kind of working out what to do really as they did hi Dolce good girl this is Diddy Dolly Dolce the divinizer anyway and then uh, there's a few other aunts I loved um, uh, Wee Mary from Portrush she was called that was my father's sister again Aunt Mary from Portrush and I loved Aunt Pearl, who was actually my father's brother's wife. She's still alive, Aunt Pearl. So big love, Aunt Pearl, if you're watching. But then there's wee Frances, because that's what she was known as. Because Aunt Frances is about uh, four foot 13, I think, something like that. Uh, but she, um, what she lacks in stature, she makes up for in the most wonderful, wonderful human being. So um, if you don't mind, just send out a nice wee positive vibe and sing happy birthday with me. Her name is Frances and she's 90 years old today. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Frances. Happy birthday to you. Hip, hip, hooray. Hip, hip, hooray. Hip, hip, hooray. Wonderful. Thank you so much indeed. That's great. Now, a very apt song. I know I did it the other day, but 
This is a very apt song for Francis, who's 90 years young today. You gonna sing along with me, Dolce? The young ones, darling, we're the young ones. And young ones shouldn't be afraid to live, love, while the flame is strong. Cause we may not be the young ones very long. Tomorrow, wait until tomorrow. Tomorrow, sometimes never comes. That's the cat pushing the camera. I'll just wait until she finishes. So love me. Cause there's a song to be sung And the best time to sing it is while we're young Once in every lifetime Comes a love like this I need you, you need me Oh my darling, can't you see Young dreams should be dreamed together and young hearts shouldn't be afraid For some day when the years have flown Darling, then we'll teach the young ones all of our own Once in every lifetime comes a love like this I need you together and young hearts shouldn't be afraid and some day when the years have flown darling then we'll teach the young ones of our own some day when the years have flown Darling, then we'll teach the young ones of our own. Now, I've got very sleepy cats today, you know. So, big, big kiss from me. I know I'm your favorite, favorite nephew, especially favorite nephew in a wheelchair who lives in the Channel Islands. But anyway, I hope, Anne Francis, you have an absolutely wonderful day. So, I, what, I was, what I would finish with before I start the storytelling... Um, one of the reasons I loved Anne Francis was she was non-judgmental. She never touched anybody. She always, no matter when you would turn up at her door, she was always very welcoming. And even if you maybe had done something that she didn't agree with, she never judged you. V very, very forgiving and very, very accommodating. And that's some of the reasons I always loved Francis. But she was just gorgeous and huggable. Is, still alive, sorry. Is gorgeous and hug huggable. And uh, a big shout out to my beautiful, absolutely gorgeous cousin, Pauline, who has devoted her life to looking after her mother. She's just a fantastic, used to do great haircuts. I don't have kind of three aside these days, not even five aside anymore. So if you're watching too, Pauline, big, big love for me too on that one. Thank you so much indeed. Mr. Snow, welcome to Manuvalu with me, Andre Reese Sheeran, and storytelling time for younger and older children. Mr. Snow by Roger Hargreaves. <clears throat> One night, two days before Christmas, it started to snow. All night it snowed, and it snowed, and it snowed, then it snowed, and after that, it snowed. Millions, billions, even trillions of big, white, soft snowflakes covered the whole wide world. Oh, maybe it was a mini ice age, uh, Good news, I get my teeth tomorrow. Four that side, three that side, I can get my teeth tomorrow. I'm so excited. But I'll, I'll probably end up like that because of the, the tongue always goes to something foreign in the face. When morning came, it was quite amazing to see just how much snow had fallen. All the houses, all the trees, all the roads, and all of the fields were covered in snow. Story within a story. 
In 2003, here on Guernsey, even the very beaches were completely covered with snow. I don't think, Jane, you might have been still living in French France at that, at that stage, or had started living in French France at that stage. But the all, all of the beaches, just literally, there were drifts of snow right up to the water's edge. It was quite uncanny to see snow on a beach. Really, really uncanny. It was almost as if a huge white blanket had been uh, gently laid over everything. Everywhere you looked was white, except for the smoke coming out of the chimney. For some reason, it's blue. <clears throat> And then the sun came out, and so did the children. They were all dressed up and all muffled up, wearing scarves and woolies and gloves and boots so that they didn't catch cold. You've had, oh gosh, you've had to shovel three times. Oh, wow. So Christian lives in Au Canada, and at this time of the year, they get a lot of snow. Mind you, um, Christian, my brother, just younger than I, my hill, hi, my hill. If you're watching by any chance, lovely fella. Uh, my hill's a teacher. He lives in Iowa, next door to where Superman used to live. But as you know, Superman died recently. So, um, what was I going to say about my hill? What was I going to say about my hill? Oh yes, the cold. Apparently, it can go down to something like minus sixty. I mean, I can't even conceptualize that. Minus 60 with wind chill where they live in Iowa. It's just a boggles the mind. All the children were so excited to see so much snow, which isn't surprising really, because there was, no, was more snow than they had ever seen before. Some of them went on the sledges, racing down hills. Some of them who didn't have sledges threw snowballs at each other. One boy even made a snowball that was almost as big as he was. One little boy even made a snowball that was so big that some of the other children had to help to, him to carry it. And then they made snowmen. Look at the size of that. That's a snowball. That's snow joke trying to lift that. Snow fun trying to lift that up in the air. Then it was Christmas Eve. The children all went home early so that they could get washed, have their dinner, go to bed, and then get up early to see if Father Christmas had brought them anything. Because remember, you only get something if you're very, very good. So I've got Dolce sitting here on the cat tree beside me. Um, Debussy is on my wheelchair. And the divination is in um, sitting on the little sofa in the living room. But they've been asleep nearly all afternoon. Just he gets up. He's like a, a baby in a way. So he gets up every few hours to... Um, to get fed and I have to protect his food from the older cats because it's so tasty because it's wet food and they love the wet food so they go in and they they try and clear help I'll just tidy that up for you story within the story so Debussy will eat his dinner he'll eat until his little belly is full because he's only he's only about the length of my book he's tiny and he'll fill his belly and when he's finished then the cats will go just tidy this up you know it looks looks so untidy I'll clean this up. Thank you, Dolce. Thank you, Diva. But that particular Christmas Eve, Father Christmas was in trouble. And the trouble was that it had snowed so much that Father Christmas got stuck. Well and truly stuck. There was so much snow that his reindeer simply couldn't pull his sleigh, piled up with all of the presents that he had to deliver to all of the children. Oh dear, thought Father Christmas. Oh, dear, dear me, what am I to do? I haven't yawned yet. Did you notice that? <sighs> no, I haven't yawned at all today. I've had a really good day today. Did a recording as well. I've been asked to sing at a wedding in September. And I've uh, been asked to sing a specific song. I might be doing some others, but this one definitely. It's called I Believe. So I managed to get the orchestration done today. And I've sent off a little snippet to see if the young lady likes it. He sat down on a sack of toys and thought and thought how he could manage to deliver all of the presents to all of the children before they woke up on Christmas morning. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear me, he said out loud. And 
He sighed. Didn't just sigh. He sat on top of his sack of toys. Now it just so happened that Father Christmas had got himself stuck beside one of the snowmen which the children had built. And that gave him an idea, a very good idea, in fact. A very, very, a very, very, very good idea. How would you like to help me? He asked the snowman. But of course, the snowman didn't answer because snowmen can't talk. Or can they? Well, look, and then look. Can you see what's missing in this one? Yes, no mouth, no smile. Of course, I have to use some of my magic to bring him to life, thought Father Christmas to himself. So he pulled on his white beard three times and muttered. I, that was more than three, I know. <clears throat> well, you see, some people will write to me and say, well, that you can't count, obviously, Andre, you know. It's been brutal. I'm so sorry, Christian. Then he said some rather magical Christmas, Father Christmassy words. Suddenly, you might almost say magically, the snowman did come to life. And look, he's smiling. He's got no teeth, but he's smiling. Hello, Father Christmas, said Mr. Snow, which was the snowman's name. You look a bit sort of um, stuck, if you ask me, which you aren't, of course, but I'll say so anyway. And if you ask me again, I'll say that you need a sort of a helping hand. Uh, and you so you know what I mean, which probably you do, because that's probably why you brought me to life, which certainly you did. So how may I be of assistance? Mr. Snow, as you may have gathered, was a rather talkative sort of a snowman. Exactly, beamed Father Christmas. Let's get started. Still doesn't have any teeths. And start they did. Mr. Snow gave Father Christmas an enormous push and off they went. They divided the work between them. It was Mr. Snow's job to make sure that all the right toys for all the right boys and girls when were put into the correct sacks. It was Father Christmas's job to make sure that he took all the right sacks down all the chimneys and delivered all the right toys to all the right girls and all of the right boys. There he is. <clears throat> Mr. Snow and Father Christmas made sure that Susan got her teddy bear to Edda see Look, we haven't had any stories with Te Edison for ages, you know. There's Michelle sending me some photographs. I'll look at them later. Mr. Snow and Father Christmas made sure that Peter got his choo-choo train. It's really interesting that people still give that type of train because they haven't existed for a hundred years, really. Well, maybe not quite, but a long, long time. Mr. Snow and Father Christmas made sure that John got his piggy bank. I don't see why they can't make an electric train that looks like one of these. And has, instead of coal, carries just water only. So it can make steam and still look like a, a train. But only put steam out in the atmosphere, not pollution. Mr. Snow and Father Christmas even made sure that little Jane got her squeaky pink effalump to play with in the bath. Hi, Dibs. And then all of a sudden, they discovered that between them, they had finished. Oops, nearly lost the camera. Dolce just jumping. She just pushed the camera right over to the edge. Don't mind us, Dolce, it's okay. I'd like to thank you very much indeed for helping me deliver all the right toys to all the right boys, all the right toys to all the right girls, said Father Christmas. And he shook Mr. Snowman by the hand. Not forgetting, etc., etc. And now I'd better turn you back into a snowman, said Father Christmas. Thank you again and goodbye. My pleasure, smiled the snowman.
And do you know from that Christmas to this Christmas, Father Christmas always chooses a snowman to help him. So the next time you build a snowman, you'd better make sure to build him properly because somebody you might know might want a snowman to give him a hand. Father Christmas. And of course, you know who that would be, don't you? Now, super excited to read the end of the story. I thought I was going to get it read yesterday, but I had to remember I had a student to teach. So I thought chapter 11 was the last chapter. There's only about four pages, even if that, even that. Probably about three were condensed. The end of it all. So this now is a story for our much older children. Why the Whales Came by Michael Moore Pergo. I had never seen the church so full as it was that next Sunday, not even at Christmas. It was a service, the vicar said, not just for one, but for two fine men of Briar who had given their lives for us all. I did not hear much of what he said. He had that kind of droning, dreary voice. Oh, hopefully it's not like mine. That is impossible to listen to for very long. I remember sitting in the front pew with mother and on one side of me was Daniel and on, on the other. Oh, sorry. Mother was on one side and Daniel was on the other. And feeling rather important and not nearly as sad as I knew I should be. I prayed though, or at least I tried to, but it came out more as a thought rather than a prayer in the end. But that's a prayer all the same. So whether or not you're a person of faith, you can still send up thoughts. And um, I believe what I happen to call God will hear them. <clears throat> I was thinking how good it would be if Father and the Birdman were to meet up in heaven. And I wondered what they would say about me. Daniel sat up, hunched up with a stiff collar around his neck and he sat close beside me. His hair was unnaturally slicked down. On the way home afterwards, we walked along together. Daniel was angry. They still don't trust me, he said. And after all the Birdman has done for us, they don't, still don't even believe in him. Father told me to keep off Samson. Says he wants to be sure the curse is finished. He says only time will tell. He's still scared, Gracie. They're all scared, except Auntie Mildred. She's not scared of anything, though. Only way to prove to them, Gracie, is we'll have to go back and fetch the horn back. If they see it and see that we have, have it, they'll have to believe everything then, won't they? Even Father and Big Tim. But for two weeks after the memorial service, the winter gales came and lashed the islands, and not a boat could move out of Briar. It was much too dangerous. Pardon me. It was much too dangerous, even just across the sheltered channel to Tresco. That meant there was no school. Yippee! And I was grateful for that. We had brought Prince back to live with us in South Hill Cottage. And those horrible goats came too, much to my disgust. Mother said someone had to look after them. I wanted to eat them. Sorry, that's not what he said at all. I wanted Daniel to look after them, but Daniel's father would not have any animals near his house. And so I found myself milking them twice a day. We had to leave the birdman's hens and friend up on Heathy Hill. Not because we wanted to, but because we could not catch them. Each day during the gales, Daniel and I went up there to feed them, hoping to be able to catch them and then bring them home. But they were always too wily for us, too clever, that means. Even when they were hungry. Then one morning we woke up and the wind had died. The tamarisk tree outside my window was still at last. I lay there beside mother, hoping the sea would be too restless after the storm for us to go to school that day. I did think it was strange when the church bell began to ring. But for my reckoning, it was a Monday morning. But it was quite, I was quite content to believe that I was incorrect and that I had another day without school. So I lay back on my pillow and was almost asleep again when Mother sat up suddenly. It's not Sunday, she said. The church bell's ringing. 
and it's not Sunday. Are you sure it isn't Sunday? I asked. It could be, couldn't it? It's Monday, Gracie, Mother said, and it's a fine day by the look of it, and you're going to school. Out of bed with you. Then why are they ringing the bell on a Monday? I asked. No idea, said Mother, but whatever it is, it can wait until after breakfast. Mother climbed out of bed. Come on now, Gracie, hurry up, else you'll miss the school boat. She looked across the bed at me. And just so you won't miss the bus, I will walk you down to the quay. We can find out then why they're ringing that bell. Prince came with us, sniffing every gateway as he passed, his tail constantly circling. And all the while, as we walked up the path, the bell kept ringing and ringing. Daniel was not waiting for me, as he usually was, and every house that we passed seemed to be empty. The front doors flung open wide and there and left there. The bell had stopped ringing, and by the time we reached Auntie Mildred's house, we were just passing her gate when we heard the first crowd. As we rounded the bend, we saw the quay below. It was full of people. You could not even see the quay for the crowd. The school boat was there, but no one was getting into it. There was another boat beside it, one that often came from St Mary's. Everyone was laughing and clapping and cheering. And then one of the, out of one of them, a man in blue, it was, was hoisted up onto his shoulders and they began to march in a great cavalcade up, up the path towards us. Prince sat down as he often did when he needed time to consider things. Who's that, Gracie? Mother said, her eyes squinting in the sun. What's all this fuss about? Daniel was herring up the path towards us and shouting as he came. That'll show them, Gracie. That'll show them. Now they'll have to believe us. It's over just like he promised. The curse of Samson is over. Can you see who it is, Gracie? Can't you see? And now I could see. Mother saw too, but she could not believe her eyes as he sat my father down on his feet again. See, I, told, I don't want to get all emotional. You see, I told you, they only said he was missing. They didn't actually say he was dead. He was MIA, missing in action. One of them handed him a stick from the crowd and then the crowd fell silent. He looked at mother, then took off his sailor's cap. Bit late for breakfast, Alma Clemmy. Mother stared at him. Well, don't look at me like that. It's me, Clemmy, honest it is. They tell me I'm supposed to be dead and drowned, but I'm not. Didn't they tell you I was coming? No, by the look on your face, I don't think they can have. What do I have to do to prove it to you? Here, take my hand, Clemmy. Feel that. It's me, isn't it? Tell me it's me or I'll begin to doubt it myself. I had my ship sunk from underneath me, Clemmy, torpedoed off Gallip Gallipoli, she was, went down in two minutes flat. There was no one else alive in the water except me. I hung on to a bit of a lifeboat for a while and then the day and the night and then a fishing boat finally picked me up. You can't believe it, can you? Well, neither could I, I can tell you. I'm a lucky fellow, Clemmy. I don't deserve to be here, but I am. I've got sick leave. Knocked my leg about a bit when I fell in the water, but I won't be needing this old stick for too long. Father looked down at me. Right home, Gracie, he said. Just off to school, were you? Mr. Wellbeloved will have to do without you for today, won't he? Hop up, he said, crouching down, and I jumped onto his shoulders. Coming, Clemmy? He said and took her hand. I could eat a horse. That same afternoon, every boat in Briar set out over the sun dancing sea for Samson. No one stayed behind, not even Big Tim. Mind you, I did notice he was the last one to set foot on Samson when he got there. They marveled at the horn above the fireplace in the cottage and everyone wanted to touch it just to be sure it was not made of wood. We roamed the island from end to end. The great black rabbits were everywhere and Prince chased them ineffectually that afternoon. He rampaged over the island like a wild thing and I found him finally stretched out on the bed in the birdman's cottage, his tongue lolling out of the side of his mouth and dripping. He's thirsty, I said. Needs a drink. There'll be water in the well now, said Daniel. I know there will be. There has to be. We ran down the hillside together, Prince bounding along after us. Surely enough, the well was full. 
full to the brim, in fact. We all three lay down on the ground and put our faces in it and drank together. Everyone drank from the well on Samson that day, as if it were the elixir of life. And after that, no one ever doubted the Birdman's story, not in my hearing anyway. So if you ever, if you ever go to the Isles of Sully, go over to Samson and look around yourself. The old ruined cottages are still there, a mound of limpet shells outside each one, and you'll find the well full of water. No one lives there, so you'll have only the terns and the black rabbits for company. You'll be quite alone. Absolutely fabulous story. Fabulous story. So tomorrow I begin a brand new story. It's Michael Moore Purgle, as you might have guessed. Patrick Carty's watching. Hello, Patrick. It's called The Ghost of Grania O'Malley. So look, there's an Irish man to an Irish man. Well, an Irish name, anyway. And I'm ringing, uh, reading, going to be reading a story called Grania O'Malley. My cat, my first ever cat uh, in French France was called Seamus O'Malley. So that's it for storytelling today. I'm really pleased um, to have been able to do this and finish that lovely, lovely story. Also to sing happy birthday to my great Aunt Frances. I'm hoping you're having an absolutely wonderful day. Lovely, lovely lady. In the meantime, keep washing those hands. Yes, keep washing those hands. And when you think you've washed them, I tell you what to do. Look, here's a wee tip. Wash your hands. And then 10 minutes later, get a clear bowl and get soap and wash your hands again really squidge them tight and have a look at the water now the, the water will get kind of cloudy because of the soap but to have a look you'll see it's actually the water's actually dirty as well that's how important it is to wash your hands look after one another and if you can help somebody else do please do that as well big love as always hang loose stay tight um three cats and i will see you on the other side 4 p.m tomorrow god bless bye now bye